Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining my talk about open source and open source is open choice, right? So in this talk, I will give you a set of tools to help ease your decision about open source adoption, when you should do it, and practical tools that you can use to choose the right open source project for you. So first of all, hi, my name is Hila Fish. I'm a senior DevOps engineer. I have 15 years of experience in the tech industry. I'm a firm believer in communities, and this is why I'm talking here in Women on Stage, because I want to elevate women uh, voices. Other than that, I'm a, an active part of the AWS Community Builders Program, and I'm also a HashiCorp ambassador because I'm talking about uh, Terraform quite a lot. I'm also a co-organizer of DevOps Days Tel Aviv, which is a big conference in Israel for uh, DevOps topics. I'm a mentor in courses and communities, and I'm a lead singer in a cover band, as you can see in this picture, which is a lot of fun. Okay, so open source. Open source is publicly available and can be modified at will. And the great thing is that a lot of tools and platforms and open like uh, operating systems, even Linux uh, that we use in our day to day is open source. So Linux is one of them, but also Git and Firefox and Java and React and all of these tools and others are open source and it is awesome. So in the late 90s, the proprietary software that a lot of companies uh, produce was considered to be the standard. And the notion of making source code public was considered to be bad strategy for tech companies. Coming forward uh, from 2020 and basically up until now, and I only see it grow and grow more, more and more, the concept of open source became mainstream. So let's understand what's so good about open source. So open source helps build a rich developer community. It is a society that is based on knowledge, of course, but it really relies on the core values and uh, Without them, it couldn't exist. So the core values are communication and collaboration. The open source re really relies on communication and collaboration in order to succeed. Manish Sharma, who's the general manager of GitHub India, said that open source is an enabler of innovation and uh, companies that basically go towards open source, it helps them speed up business uh, transformation. So if a company has open sourced its cloud or cloud native uh, projects, then it gains visibility into what the future of cloud and cloud native will be. And it ensures that it is part of the always advancing tech landscape. Also, open source helps boost code quality and security because if what we talked about open source, it is publicly available, right? So if a lot of uh, people can see uh, the code, then they can uh, potentially spot any issues, security loopholes, uh, bugs and, and stuff like that. And then the code will be in much higher quality state and more secured. So uh, Linus Torvald, who's, who's the creator of Linux and Git, said that given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. So if a lot of people will see uh, the code, they could potentially spot and correct errors and omissions, and then the code will be much better. Second thing is adaptivity. So if we have more users, then we have more use cases. And if we have more use cases, we have a much more robust code. And it is adaptive to various use cases because it allows surfacing bugs and edge cases much more rapidly than traditional QA processes. Also, it encourages more modularity, basically avoiding the one size fits all kind of assumption resulting in a great flexibility and lower uh, customization costs in the long run. Agility, another thing. So modern software development processes uh, basically is something that we will see in a lot of uh, open source projects. So they are following these uh, modern software development processes, which leads to rapid development cycles, which leads to more frequent releases without sacrificing quality. And also we, has, we have a less bureaucracy because Opening a PR versus opening a commercial support ticket. Uh, we can't uh, compare the two. Of course, PRs are much more lenient and uh, flexible, uh, and we can introduce more changes because of that. And also, in a proprietary uh, software companies, they have regularly scheduled release processes. Uh, I assume so. I, I mean, this is why it was uh, throughout the years. Maybe they changed a bit to be much, much more agile back in open source, but they can't beat uh, open source in the sense of whenever there's a new uh, feature uh, and it, it makes you, you take the new feature and you put it in a new version, then you just release the version and that's it. You, and all the users can choose to whether adopt it at the, at the same time or not. 
they have full flexibility of when to use it. So this is awesome. Okay, so let's talk about the DevOps perspective towards open source, because usually this is something that is more considered to be like the holy grail of uh, developers and not really DevOps. So let's understand the DevOps perspective towards open source and see uh, how uh, basically we, we use it in our day to day. So first of all, in order to understand the a DevOps perspective, we need to understand the dev perspective. So developers say, basically, we think about functionality. So uh, will the open source library get integrated in my code properly and what efforts are needed to do so? Maybe we need to do refactoring or something of this sort. So basically, they think about functionality. DevOps engineers, on the other hand, think about the environment. So we think about how well will the uh, project get integrated into the environment as a whole, and also other peripheral stuff like security and overall maintenance that will be required to maintain this uh, project uh, in the day-to-day. -day. Another thing is that um, collaboration is a common ground between DevOps and open source. And when it comes to challenges, a uh, collaboration leads to better conclusions and solutions. So when communities form around shared uh, challenges, the diversity of ideas that naturally emerges surfaces better solutions. And we all want to have uh, better solutions because DevOps engineers are basically the production gatekeepers. We want to make sure we introduce something new that helps uh, our users, but we don't want to rock the boat too much. So we want to make sure we choose the best solution possible uh, for our environment, for our use cases, for our users, uh, etc. Also, we treat open source as tools and we ask ourselves, do we want to do, to do something that will help us deliver code or automate this or introduce this capability? So basically, we can really re uh, be flexible with what we introduce to our system because integration is no strange concept for us. A lot of DevOps engineers came from integration background, system engineers, system admins. So we did integrations, uh, I don't know to say on a daily basis, but uh, in the overall in the, the job we did it quite a lot so basically if we introduce another tool uh, to our tool chain we say okay that's good because we are used to having integrations we are used to integrating stuff to our current um, uh, environment so this is something that is not uh, strange for us of course we have to think about also the the complex and not only the good so um we need to think about for example, uh, upgrades, okay? We want to uh, introduce new capabilities, but we don't want to rock the boat too much. Uh, for example, uh, take for example, Jenkins. Jenkins, uh, there are features and etc. but the, uh, the most um, terrifying thing about uh, Jenkins is the plugins. Maybe I will upgrade the plugin, then the entire Jenkins will break down and wouldn't start. So this is something that we need to think about. Is the upgrading worthwhile or we need to wait a bit until we really need the features that the, uh, the upgrade will bring with it. Uh, so basically we are in a constant state of trade-offs and uh, maintaining balance. Also complexity, Jenkins is one a, a form of it or one example, another is Kubernetes. It has a lot of dependency, a lot of things to consider. So we need to always think about these complexities before we introduce new tool to our uh, environment. And since uh, the environment stability is our focus, in the middle of everything, we always need to do some research to make sure that we know exactly what we are introducing to the environment. Another thing, and this is really general to uh, basically being an engineer and not only for open source, is to be uh, to keep tabs and be informed of what's going on. And I will show you how it is linked to open source uh, specifically. So let's say I found a tool, version 1.0 is not quite what I need. The, the use case is not really fit. Uh, I mean, the, the classic use case of the tool doesn't really fit my use case, or there is a very big bug that I can't really afford to introduce to the environment because it will rock the boat. Uh, so maybe I need to keep tabs and, and uh, follow this tool. And then maybe version 2.0, this uh, bug will be fixed and the um, use case will be much more fitted for my use case, etc. So if we keep tabs, we can uh, check what's going on and maybe we will uh, decide whether to introduce this tool later on because then it will be much more suitable. 
Another uh, example is with CentOS operating system. So CentOS uh, reached the end of life at the end of 2021, which means no more security patches are being released for uh, CentOS, which means that if I don't know about it, then I'm putting my systems at risk because no security patches means uh, other hackers or anything of the sort can be exploited if uh, the servers are not patched. So these are two examples for open source. And I really like this picture because if you can see, it says keep moving people, even though no one is there. That's exactly it. We need to keep moving and basically, basically uh, move ourselves without having our team leader breathe down our necks and say, hey, check this, check that. We need to, to check things on our own and be proactive. And I think this will help you be a better engineer in general. So. Now let's discuss when should we consider adopting open source because maybe it's not suitable for all cases. So let's cover some uh, use cases that you should think uh, about uh, adopting open source. First of all, when you have an uncommon use case, uh, for example, a Keda. A Keda is an open source tool that really helped uh, us in my previous company. We had a use case of uh, we use the GKE, which is the uh, Google uh, Cloud uh, uh, Kubernetes engine. And uh, we had an application that uh, ran on uh, Kubernetes without having the need to run all the time. So only when something happened, then the application needs to run. And other cases, they, uh, the application could stop running. And a GKE all, only allowed downscaling pods in Kubernetes to one and not to zero. So we searched online and we found Keda. Keda is an open source tool that allows you to downscale pods based on uh, several use cases like check uh, queue messages uh, and all sort of conditions. So we integrated this tool and basically it fitted our uncommon use case uh, like a glove and it was uh, awesome. So this is one uh, use case. Another use case is to solve your developer needs. Uh, another story for that, we had in other uh, company that I worked for, we had a, a, a case where we had some uh, script or mini system that ran on, on a server and uh, we had some uh, non even non developers we had someone from the finance team that needs to run this process manually like every once in a while it wouldn't it couldn't be automatic because they need to run it uh, like not on a constant uh, dates but only when something happens and we couldn't check when this thing happens so we couldn't automate it uh, uh, at all, but we knew that once in a while, sh uh, she, the, the finance uh, uh, person, needs to go to the server and run this process. We didn't want to let her run the process uh, on the server itself because she's not tech, you know, she's not techy. Maybe she will do something to harm the server, of course, not uh, intentionally, but maybe because she's not fully uh, uh, with full expertise in uh, systems. So we thought about what should we do and we found a tool uh, called a uh, script server which allows to uh, basically make scripts and terraform code and ansible playbooks and all sort of things accessible through a ui with permissions mechanism and that way it also had some guardrails like if she uh, picks a certain a uh, parameter then other parameter is grayed out because it couldn't run together for example so this tool was awesome because that way uh, she just she doesn't go to the server itself she goes to the ui runs the script with a um, specific parameters that you need to put uh, to put and that's it so that's uh, that was awesome it solved our needs uh, developers, even finance. So if you have a uh, kind of things that needs to be solved for your developers needs, maybe you will find a, an open source tool that will help you do that. Limited budget. So when your budget is limited, maybe you need, uh, maybe you can use the free version of software or an open source alternative. And we also need to think about a, a, the a lower total cost of ownership. Uh, so Adopting open source generally has a lower cost because the software itself often comes at no cost or relatively low cost. And it shifts the cost center from licensing to customization and implementation. And also think about it this way, training and maintenance and support will be equally invested in an open source project adoption versus proprietary software. So might as well boost uh, open source adoption if no significant reason is preventing you from uh, doing so. 
Another reason for uh, adopting open source is when you have insufficient in-house resources, ability-wise, like this uh, uh, family guy right here, or capacity-wise to uh, bring a solution. And also, uh, why create a solution of your own, right? Maybe, um, you know, there's the saying, don't reinvent the wheel. Maybe there's an open source tool that already uh, fits your use case. So you, need, you don't need to invest resources ability or capacity or anything of the sort if maybe there is an open source tool that uh, allows you to do whatever you need to do okay we can't talk about the good without talking about the bad right there is no uh, good without the bad so let's discuss some downsides for adopting open source of course there are more than what i'm gonna show here but these are the ones that i think that is worthwhile to uh, put the emphasis on so first of all, security by obscurity, uh, this notion doesn't apply. Uh, proprietary software companies can claim that their code is more secure than open source alternatives because of that, because of security uh, uh, by obscurity that the code is not exposed. Uh, and then it will be harder for uh, hackers to exploit loopholes since the code is not available. So this is something to consider. Another thing is that uh, open source is sometimes is prone to abuse. It doesn't happen a lot, but there are uh, two cases where I'm going to share with you not right now that it happened. So, for example, one of them is a colored NPM package, which the, uh, one of the maintainers introduced a loop in the code. And then basically all the companies that uh, automatically pulled latest, uh, it created a lot of issues for them and stuff uh, stopped working. Um, and another thing is, another package is Faker.js, where the maintainer, if I'm not mistaken, had a bankruptcy. So the next version that he released was basically non-version. He deleted the project entirely. So you can say, hey, I can, um, uh, let's say, uh, put a specific version and then we can avoid latest and stuff like that. Yeah, but if all companies would do that, probably would we wouldn't even know about the colors and PM package uh, scenario uh, globally, right? So that's the thing. We need to be aware that it is sometimes prone to abuse, and we need to think about it, especially if we introduce tools to production. Compliance. So in its raw form, open source usually gives no warranty or official guarantee, making it difficult to use in a business environment where compliance is a must. So it's also something to consider. Open source is not always free, okay? Uh, take, for example, recent uh, change a recent recent lines, a license change by Terraform. It, they change it to BSL business uh, model. So it doesn't mean that it's not free to use at all. It's just not free to use in a product or a, any constellation which directly compete with HashiCorp, the company that uh, created a uh, Terraform. So we need to always check the uh, the licenses carefully um, because we don't. Maybe we will start using it and then. Uh, things will shift and we need to shift along with it. So we always need to check the license more carefully. Discontinued projects. So when you purchase a shelf product software, it usually comes with a guarantee of official support from the developers for a fixed period of time. Uh, this is only a rule of thumb and it has its exceptions because product, pro product shelf software support doesn't mean it will be honored and delivered in a proper way. It doesn't mean that the, the uh, support will be even good, okay? So that's uh, that. And also, since sometimes the open source tools will be backed up by companies, and then what I said is uh, also applied to that because they have companies to back it up. So probably they will have some sort of support. But also uh, for, for tools that uh, are maintained by people like you and me, it means that you need to uh, think about the fact that they could stop maintaining it. And it means that you need to either maintain it yourself or move to another tool. So this is also something to consider. Support is not guaranteed. You need to assume good faith. So uh, that's it. Yeah, they don't owe you anything, especially if the tool doesn't uh, backed up by a company, but I had cases where I opened a support and, and basically issues on GitHub and they helped me even on non-business hours. So you should assume good faith with, with the open source. It really, you shouldn't uh, uh, discourage yourself because the the entire realm of open source relies on communication and collaboration. So if you'll say that it is important to you, probably they will go uh, towards you. 
And last but not least, uh, SaaS alternatives. Uh, it's not really the opposite of an open source, but uh, on some occasions, companies will prefer the SaaS managed solution because it saves them time. Time to manage the software, to integrate it, and basically, dev enablement shifts from the DevOps dependency to a cloud lock scenario that in the overall uh, trade-off is worthwhile. And SaaS popularity is likely only to rise as organizations uh, shift more and more resources to the cloud. So to sum things up in, in regards of uh, adapting open source, there's no right or wrong uh, when it comes to that. It's a matter of perspective and there are multiple factors uh, to consider uh, and you need to choose what's best for your needs. Speaking about your needs, how do we choose an open source project? Let's say I Google the use case. I found two, three, four uh, open source tool product, products that somehow fit uh, my use case. How do I choose which one to integrate? So basically we have these uh, key metrics. Uh, we will uh, gonna uh, go over each one and see how they help us uh, evaluate the open source tool. So uh, first of all, popularity. Check uh, the GitHub styles. If there are a lot of styles, uh, it probably means it is popular. Of course, if the company, if the if this tool is backed up by a company, uh, probably or maybe they have marketing uh, system or marketing engine that drives uh, popularity as well. So just bear that in mind. But usually, styles is uh, is a good thing to to look at. Uh, check if the tool is part of CNCF or incubator, because if so, it means that it follows a uh, high standards of uh, implementation of and, and of usage. And Google the project alone to check for online pres presence and also Google it versus similar products to check for uh, reviews. And that way you will see how popular it is, uh, how good it is to use and, and some things you can also only know about through these reviews because maybe they are not covered in the, the formal documentation, but they will be covered in these reviews. So this is also something to consider. Activity. So check the uh, commits rate. Are they daily, weekly, monthly? How many issues are there? How many releases are there? Is the project maintained by one developer or more? Does the project have sponsors, basically uh, companies or individuals that believe in the roadmap of this project and, and want to invest money in order to see the roadmap come to life? So all this, these uh, things will help you understand that if you have a, a tool that you integrated and you uh, rely heavily on uh, fixes or or um, features and stuff like that, how long should you wait for these bug fixes and features to come out? Because if it's not that active, you probably uh, need to uh, wait quite a while. And if you really rely on that, you rely on the activity, then it wouldn't be really suited for your use case. Security. Um, basically, this is something that in my experience, I less found it uh, problematic uh, in the DevOps perspective because usually you take a tool and the tool is is like a standalone in, in a chain of events, let's say, uh, and it's more related to a developer's uh, perspective because they take a, a library and then the library could have supply chain uh, issues and stuff like that. But security is something that you should always consider. So when once you find a tool, check if they have known, uh, known vulnerabilities, any supply chain considerations, any security issue, issues that could potentially uh, harm your environment or be um, a consideration to, to think about. Readiness. So is the project declared as production ready? Uh, for example, the CADA, the a project that I mentioned before is declared as production ready, which is good because me as a production gatekeeper, I need to make sure it is in a ready enough state for production. Are the current features enough to sustain usage? And is my use case covered fully in the current state? And if not, am I okay with it? Because if I'm not okay with it, maybe I need to wait, keep tabs on this uh, tool or project, and then maybe the next version will be much more uh, suitable for my needs. So uh, this is also something to consider. Documentation. So documentation is basically, as I like to call, uh, the gateway to the project. You don't know anything about the project and you want to make sure that uh, things that you need to know are covered and basically to read about them. So check if the documentation is rich and cover most aspects like how to integrate known issues and explanations about the features. If so, it will help you understand if it's really is best suitable for your use case. It will help you with the integration and it will help you understand what's going on. Maybe there is a, 
a bug or an issue that you can't really afford introducing now, but maybe you will wait and until this uh, issue will be resolved and then the, this tool will be much more suitable for your use case. Ecosystem. So this is one of the, for me, uh, important, most important uh, key metrics to evaluate an uh, open source tool. And why is that? Because this is the one that you will feel in your day to day. And I will give an example for that. So in one of my previous companies, uh, I used Randec, which, which is an open source tool for the ICD. And at that time, documentation wasn't rich and the ecosystem was very small. So whenever I had to Google for stuff about the, the tool, I didn't find a lot of articles online because the ecosystem was small. And even when I tried, you know, going to Facebook groups or Discord, or I don't know if there was Discord, I don't think there was Discord at that time, but uh, I don't know if there was Slack. Was Yeah, Slack was available at that time. So I tried also Slack workspaces for, you know, for DevOps and general stuff like that. And people say, ah, I use Randec here and there, or I don't use Randec. I didn't even hear, heard about Randec and stuff like that. So this really affected my day to day because whenever I tried to introduce new features, introduce new capabilities, uh, enhance pipelines, it was very hard for me because the computation wasn't helpful enough. Uh, and people wouldn't uh, use it uh, much, so they couldn't help me uh, like in chats and also no uh, Stack Overflow or any other documentation that helped me fix issues. So this is why it's so important in your day to day, because uh, as opposed to that, in other company that I worked for, I use Jenkins and you can say a lot of Jenkins about uh, CICD, but it is a very wide adopted uh, tool. So you have a lot of documentation about it, <coughs> a lot of people using it and there is actually an entire workspace, workspace uh, in Slack dedicated for uh, Jenkins. So a lot of people are helpful and, and want to help you adopt it uh, and help each other. And a lot of uh, documentation also online when you search for stuff. So it is much more easier to maintain in day to day because the ecosystem is uh, very big. So that's about that. And also check if it has dedicated a uh, community channels, Slack, Telegram, Discord, uh, or any other, because it will help you in your day-to-day -day when you want to consult with people and check if the users are engaged on GitHub, because maybe users will open issues that in the long run will help uh, make the uh, project much more robust and much more uh, suited for various use cases. Ease of use. So do a POC, see how well it gets integrated in your environment, and also check the issues, issues on GitHub. Are the issues about features or about how do I do X? Because if the issues are about how do I do X, probably the project is not that easy to use and you need to think about it, especially if you don't have a lot of people to maintain it and then you need uh, something that is more easy to use uh, and to introduce changes to. And last but not least, a roadmap is the project defined as an open source or is planned to go towards monetization. Sometimes they uh, declare about that. And also uh, features planning. So check um, the features and maybe uh, they are planning to do things uh, in the roadmap that is most suitable for your use case. And then you will wait for these features. Uh, so it is also something to consider. So uh, in terms of how to choose an open source project, the summary of it, Ask the general questions to cover the basics to understand if the project is in a ready enough state in general. And then ask the tailored specific questions to cover your use case and your pain points. So for example, if you have a heavy use case, then focus and put more emphasis on the documentation and ecosystem metrics. But if you, for example, don't have capacity in your day-to-day -to, -day to maintain the tool, then you should put emphasis on a readiness and ease of use metrics. Do a POC, see how well it gets integrated in your environment. And once you get the hang of it, you play with this with the tool, then you understand, yeah, it's good or not good to use. And rely on, it, on your research ecosystem to the rescue and engage in GitHub, raise issues and contribute for the project success and also your success. And a small token for my side, how to contribute to open source without writing a single line of code because we don't know how to write code well enough or because we don't have the time to do it. Uh, so open bug fixes and feature requests, and this way um, the, the tool will be much more robust and fitted for more use cases. Modified documentation, as I just showed, documentation is a, one of the key metrics. So if you have the skill of writing documentation, please uh, uh, leverage it. A lot of people will thank you, including myself. This way, 
maybe the next person will uh, decide to use and, uh, and adopt and do a PLC of this tool because of your modified documentation. So uh, that's that. Share your use case, write blog posts, the, the tool that I mentioned before, the script server with the UI. I uh, have written a blog post about it and that way uh, I hope other people would be able to uh, adopt it if it fits their use cases. Share tools that you found with colleagues and techie friends because if you share it, maybe they will use it because it fits their use cases. Company or individual sponsorship. So uh, a lot of the times, especially if a, a tool is only maintained by a, an individual, they need the money to, to work on it instead of their day-to-day -day job. Uh, so if you can uh, pitch in and contribute money, or maybe you can convince your company to uh, sponsor this uh, a project because you use this project in the day-to-day -day in, in that company, then it could really help uh, boosting the open source project and help make it more uh, alive day-to-day. Uh, -day. Hold an open source mindset. So if you have a use case, uh, consider adopting open source rather than an, a proprietary software, and then you will adopt a, a tool hopefully, and then other people will see, hey, this tool is so cool. It really fits our use cases. And then it will open their minds to uh, adopting open source. So it's like a chain reaction that could happen. So if you have an open source mindset, it's really helpful uh, to for open source adoption. And last but not least, uh, spread the open source uh, 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 word in conferences, uh, and that way people would know about it more and maybe would be more inclined to uh, contribute to open source. And this is uh, how I try to contribute even more to open source. So we have uh, an open source uh, community in Israel called Pull Request, and we have their basically uh, testimon testimonials from companies how they adopt open source. So you can uh, check it out if you want. So that's it. I really hope that you enjoyed my talk uh, and basically I hope that you now have the tools that you need in order to adopt open source and evaluate the tools that you find in order to see if they fit your use cases or not. Uh, feel free to add me on LinkedIn or reach out through email or Twitter or whatever you want. If you have things to uh, talk about, about open source, about uh, DevOps, SREs, uh, kind of topics. So I'll be happy to, to talk more. So thank you. Bye-bye.